Hi, Christina. It is wonderful to have you on the show. Uh, we go way back uh, through Mind Valley and different um, podcast episodes as well. And you have a new book coming out. And so I'm just honored to have you here because this is going to release right after the book launch. So thank you for coming on to our Live Boldly podcast. Thank you so much for having me. And yes, I'm actually excited to be on the other side of the microphone. I mean, we both have microphones anyway, right. but I, I remember interviewing you. <laughs> yeah, it was. And that was fun. That was a lot of fun. We talked about all sorts of stuff. Thank I want to dive into uh, the book. Can you, first of all, give us the name of the book and tell us a little bit about it. But really what we're going to do is dive further in beyond the book. That's what I would like mm. to do with you. So my book is called Becoming Flossom. And uh, the word flossom is not uh, a generally known word. So sometimes people ask me what it means. Uh, to put it very simply, uh, being flossom means uh, imperfectly perfect so, or being good despite our imperfections. But that's a very simple way of putting it. And the book, again, in simple terms, it's about self-acceptance and self-love. But of course, uh, such such a complex thing as self-love requires quite a lot of groundwork. So in my book, I go through a lot of material and a lot of uh, observations that I've made in the 20 years in personal growth and transformation industry. So it's um, it would be very simple, simplistic to say that it's about self-love. It's about being imperfect. It's actually about life. Which is what we need more of right now. We need, I <laughs> was just having this conversation with uh, my clients in the Grand Canyon about how perfectly imperfect or imperfectly perfect do you want to, however you want to state it, that we, each one of us are and how self-love is. It's, it's so hard for some people to really dive into the self-love. Why do you think that is? I always find this question very complex because, it is complex. Uh, you know, on one side, I have a feeling that people, uh, think that uh, we have an excess of self-love in contemporary world because that looks we if we look anywhere there's a lot of uh, competition and in a way bragging and maybe sugar coating and um, looking for approval and uh, well the very simple uh, expression of that is uh, if you like my content, like, like, it, like it, leave a comment and all that right. so on one side it seems that we live in a world which is self-obsessed but yet, very often I get the question, why is it so hard to love yourself? Mm -hmm. Which is such a curious combination, don't you think? And I think I get more of the question, why is it so hard to love yourself? Which in the beginning, when I, when I heard that question, I was so puzzled. I was wondering, what do you mean it's so hard to love yourself? Aren't we a little bit, uh, a little bit overdoing sometimes? But I think that it's hard to love ourselves um, Maybe because of the way we were brought up and uh, there's no fault of our parents or the education system. It's just the paradigm in which humanity has lived for thousands of years. Uh, the paradigm that uh, that uh, to become a better person means unbecoming something bad. <laughs> as if as if to be better, uh, you have to correct a mistake. Uh, so we live in a, uh, in a world which uh, is obsessed with fixing and, and improving and and, and um, you know, I don't like actually fixing because it implies brokenness. So if even if you look at the contemporary, um, contemporary, let's say media, uh, a lot of the information, the news, the, the marketing are built on the premise that something is wrong with us and we need it fixed right, right. away. And I think fixing yourself is such a trap. It's because we try to fix ourselves into being perfect and thus worthy of love where the problem arises. That couldn't be said any better than what I also agree with. How have you gotten to the space of understanding self-love so deeply? Did you have experiences in your own life that brought you to this point? I wonder if I understand it deeply enough. I think I still struggle with self-love. Uh, I think we all do. I'm uh, a woman of 45 who has put on a little bit of weight, not too much, but uh, it, sufficiently to be discontent. Uh, I am not uh, as young as I used to be 20 years ago. It's hard. It's hard to be a mature woman in the contemporary society, which uh, glorifies beauty and youth, right? So I, I struggle with, uh, with some aspects of self-love. I mean, we all struggle with things. It would be a little bit 
scary if we if if we had figured everything out there would be nothing to nothing to learn nothing new to learn but in my case i think it's a curiosity i uh, just keep asking questions it's a combination of the two things curiosity and kindness <laughs> i i'm just kindness. easy on myself yeah you know <laughs> Well, and I, so here's, so I'm turning 50 this year. Okay. So let's actually, if we could Mm -hmm. even hone this in a little bit into women that are in this stage, right. Where maybe you feel like, cause I know for me growing up that there was a whole thing about perfection and get thinner, do, you know, make yourself look prettier, do the whole thing. And as we're aging, I have found personally that one of the most amazing things is just not caring just not caring. I just don't care. I just don't care what other people, of course, I care what other people think, right? There is that space. But on the other space of it, there's this freedom to just be yourself and this authenticity and this vulnerability to just show up as you. And I think it is hard to get to that place. It is a lot of pulling back the layers and being kind to yourself and fiercely compassionate and not caring that you put on a few extra pounds here and there. Uh, can we dive into that? I, I think we all have our own um, our own challenges, mm-hmm. and uh, and and for some people, certain aspects are easier to accept than other aspects. Some people struggle with seemingly easy things or like things which maybe are not a problem for for us, and the others struggle with something else. But what caught my ear was this: that you don't care which I don't necessarily equate to self-love. And I don't want to judge your uh, senses because I, I do not know how you feel uh, internally. Sometimes, and, and, and that is, that's again an interesting thing about self-growth. Uh, we, we need to see the essence of, of things and there is uh, there, there are hardly any absolutes. So while on one side, not caring about another person's opinion might be uh, the sign of strength and you're knowing your values, you're knowing what you are and not being phased by other people's opinions. I was just uh, recently given an example how how uh, through through a little bit of internal struggle, I had to admit that I'm actually pretty good at reading meditations, partially because I also got quite a lot of compliments about that. But for me, just accepting that uh, that thing about myself was a little bit scary. I was so not modest. That's so not humble. How can I say that about myself? But it just happened so that as as I made that conclusion and I actually forced myself to admit it to myself, looking at myself in the mirror, uh, somebody came up to me and and criticized me. There, we we were running an event of, and there were quite a few, like hundred people, a few hundred people. And one of them didn't like my accent and actually left uh, while I was doing meditation, saying that I can't do meditations with her because I just can't get her accent and she's so annoying. And in that case, my thought was because I admitted to myself that. I, it, it was my decision that I, I consider myself good at that. My thought wasn't like, oh, my God, how dare he? My thought was that's his his loss. I know I'm good. Absolutely. If you can't see it, it's too bad. Right. Too bad he can be so distracted. So, so there is that level of I don't care, which is a highest pilotage. And I believe that's what you were talking about. Yet there's a lot of superficial I don't care, which oh, is right. not the actual I don't care, which is which is giving up. Right. which is i can't be bothered it's too hard or or maybe even an armor so the question is uh, is can you see behind the surface into the essence of the things mm-hmm. and understand does it really not uh, bother or does it really not um, influence your opinion about yourself or are you just hiding your uh, head in the in the sand. So when it comes to a self image, I'm not at that place yet. Mm. I still I still get hurt occasionally <laughs> or I criticize myself. When it comes to my other flaws in personality for example, <laughs> then I'm much closer to to really not caring, really not being faced by other people's opinions because I know that it's about them, not about me. Yeah, it's taken me a long time to get to this space of not being phased by other people's opinions. That being said, I value other people's opinions. And I also, when they do, when I do get people's opinions that don't, uh, that might hurt, because they do, there's sometimes where it's like, ooh, that one stung. I've had it happen many times over the last few months, actually. And at the same time, the beauty, I think, in diving into that self love piece is sitting there saying, okay, what does this have to do with me versus what does this have to do with them? 
right? And because so much, it's it doesn't even have to do with you. So much of it doesn't even have to do with you. And I think that that's the place that I finally have stepped into after a long time, by the way. It's taken me a long time. Um, and I, I think that it can also be one of our greatest struggles getting to that place. It's, it's, it definitely requires um, some philosophical approach to life, but I can, uh, I can give you, <laughs> your, I can give you, my dear listener, not, not, not just you, Sarah, yeah. a, a spoiler. Uh, everybody's opinion has nothing to do with you. Right. <laughs> can you say that again? <laughs> everybody's opinion has nothing to do with you. It's right. just about them. It's, it's just about them. About them. <laughs> what when something hurts you, it's because they actually uh, triggered something in you, which has to do with you, of course, right. not with them. But their opinion, at any in any case, has nothing to do with you. We, uh, well, people don't even care about us, honestly enough. <laughs> But except the the ones who love us and who are very close to us and and with whom we work, but generally we can't really be bothered to um, to take other people so so personally. Uh, but that's not even it. Uh, your your relationship with the world is reflection of your relationship with yourself. We notice in the world what what is in our uh, worldview, in our picture of reality, what we know through ourselves. If you notice certain irritating qualities in other people, it's because you either struggle with those within yourself or you have been on the receiving end of those irritating qualities. You have been maybe a victim of, uh, well, let's say if, if it's a manipulative behavior, for example, right? You don't have to be a manipulator to, to be triggered by it. So at any rate, you do it through the prism of your own experience. So to give it a little bit more um, more pragmatic context, uh, do you know that there is such a thing as emotions which are unknown to other nationalities, emotions which are peculiar to certain nationalities that other nationalities cannot um cannot experience like in uh in Japanese there's the uh, emotion of losing face we kind of can cognitively understand what it means but we can never truly experience that because it is not in our social um you know social context so if you haven't experienced a certain thing it's really hard to feel it when you come um in touch with that because you really experience the world through your own uh, personal kind of relationship with yourself and through your own personal experience. So even, even compassion is only possible to the degree that you have personally experienced certain things, which is why whatever people tell you, it is usually their own uh, perception of you, their own perception of the situation. It's not really about you. Uh, and that's that's something which uh, which sometimes is hard to hard to understand. But if you if you um, pay attention, you will notice that yeah, maybe people th there is such a thing as coincidence. They may hit the you know the nail on the head and actually uh, actually <laughs> tell you things which are relevant to you. But it will only hurt you if you relate to that. Right. Like if I were, if if you were to tell me that uh, that my green hair doesn't fit me, I wouldn't feel anything because I know my hair isn't green. Ah, holy moly! Right, of course, of course. So let's when you're in your book, do you work through this with people? Is there a context where you dive into how to love yourself more? I do think yes. here's the thing. And I also want to point something out. This is not a struggle for any particular person. This is a struggle across the world, male, female. I mean, it's just every, every human struggles with this at some point, I do believe in their lifetime. And it also can impact their worthiness. It impacts where they, where they feel like they might not be worthy of something that they really do want in life. Um, and so this isn't this this conversation is for everyone. That is my point. It's not simply for you, me, the listener who right now it literally is. This is something that everyone that I know of even has struggled with at some point in their life. I absolutely agree with you because that's uh, that the, um, the we see the consequences of the lack of love, mm -hmm. self love, mm -hmm. and the consequences are all the nasty things we do to each other. Hurt yes. people, hurt people. As you know, if we continue that same logic, 
your relationship with the world is the reflection of your relationship with yourself. Yeah. Hurt people, hurt people. Usually if somebody says nasty, something nasty to you, it's not because they feel well. They have been threatened. They have had their hurts. They lash out, they attack. You know, like this animal who has been cornered, they have to bite, even if they can't, if they if, if they can't, uh, you know, win, they still have to bite. So the fact that we don't love enough, uh, ourselves enough is obvious because of all the nasty things we do to each other. Well, People we who are content and who love themselves, they, they don't need to prove anything to anyone. Right. They don't need to put anyone down down you know in there's one thing i've learned in in 20 years in this industry is that you know it's easier to do to the world what you're doing to yourself if you're capable of being forgiving to yourself it's much easier to forgive other people if you're capable of being tolerant towards your own quirks it's much easier to take the quirks of other people if you can forgive yourself for failure you're much more compassionate to other people's failure because as i said you know we uh, we uh, interact with the world the same the same way we interact with ourselves Mark so if if we love. had enough self love we wouldn't have hurt right keep going i i just like i just love Sorry, this so much you know you're like we're 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 coming across the pond so sometimes <laughs> this happens where we you know but i i love this so much because everything starts with self right like everything starts with self. And I, and I talk to people all the time about even forgiveness, what you're touching on. It's, it's when we take our power and we put it into somebody else before we actually empower ourselves to love ourselves more deeply, to release the pain, to say, I'm going to forgive me first for whatever it is. Maybe it's simply for the patterns that we're choosing in life, right? That we're still stepping into when we can d dive into ourselves and forgive ourselves first, that is so much more powerful of a, of a gift, right? And then we can start to look at how can I forgive other people? Yeah. So I agree. It is, uh, it is the struggle of every single one of us. And as I said, you know, the book is not just about self-love. I think self-love is the ultimate expression of your work with yourself. You, uh, you, you need to do so many things to get to self-love. Uh, you need to learn to be honest with yourself. Well, first you need to be aware of what's going on to even notice. Then you need to learn to be honest with yourself. You need to have courage. You need to be kind to yourself. You need to keep working with what's coming up. And uh, and that's why I think self-love is is like the, you know, it's the pinnacle of, the, of, of all the groundwork that needs to be done before you get there. Uh, and yes, I agree. It's a struggle for for all of us, and maybe maybe some of our listeners don't relate to being middle aged women <laughs> because because you know may, they might not relate. They might not relate with struggles with my struggles of of self image after having been perfect all my life, finally being just just being, not being you know ugly or anything, but imperfect, and right. that's. That's fine, but some people might relate with uh, with other things, with uh, how they take failure. With uh, you know, we we all have our pain points with uh, how we take our quirks. We don't even dare usually to uh, to acknowledge those quirks, but there are things about us that nobody can change. And uh, the way our society works is that we try to ignore the presence of those. Uh, those qualities which make us shrink and feel ashamed, ignore or eradicate them or work on them, fix ourselves. Fixing implies brokenness. I don't think anybody is really truly broken. I think we are very often wounded. But if you're wounded, you need healing, not fixing. That's a beautiful, beautiful statement right there. So what else? So let's dive into other parts of the book. When we're talking about uh, being perfectly imperfect and how beautiful that is. Um, let's dive into that. Let's dive into that. How did you, first of all, how did you come up upon this type of book? Can I ask you that? Like how, what made you write a book like that had, because I know I, I always find this interesting asking authors, what brought yeah. you to this particular subject or to this particular way of writing or whatever it is? What brought you to that? I, you know, at this point, it's okay to ask me how I wrote my book, <laughs> but thank you for qualifying because I understand what you mean. Uh, I actually, um, 
I think this book is uh, unusual. <laughs> I am absolutely aware that there are, I think I've heard the number 13 million books being published every year. Isn't that scary? That's, That's scary. a lot of books. A lot of yeah. books. And I believe I believe it's uh, it's probably all the self-published books also go into that number. Amazon makes it easy to self-publish. So what makes my book a little bit unusual is, first of all, I actually love um, classical literature and I don't read a lot of self personal growth books. I, I, I've been in the industry for 20 years and a lot of authors, I uh, learn from a lot of authors at their events or working with them on one on one or talking to them. I, I don't like reading books in my own industry <laughs> too much because I have been brought up on classical literature uh, starting from you know from ancient Greek literature and uh, and going all the way up to the contemporary. So for me, the beauty of the language is important. So, uh, which is why I was really uh, puzzled before I started the book. I didn't want to just write another textbook or didactical thing. <laughs> for me, it was a journey. It had to be a journey, uh, which I, I tried. I tried to maintain it as a journey. So when I say a journey, imagine Lord of the Rings. You open this massive book and you have no idea what's going to happen. Nobody's going to tell you that the fellowship is going to break apart, you know, that you're going to face, uh, well, face the monsters that you didn't know from the very beginning. So I try to maintain that in my book as and I refuse to, <laughs> I usually refuse to, <laughs> to give spoilers as to what's happening. Also, it's not my journey anymore. It used to be my journey, but the moment it's published and it's in my reader's hands, it's the journey of the reader. And every single reader has their own unique destination because self-love is a unique destination. Because the self is unique destination. Being authentic is unique destination. Uh, being real to yourself is unique. So that's why I believe that this, this book is a journey. But also, I've been in personal growth for 20 years. So that it, it expresses itself in everything. First of all, I think it's a cry for help. Mm. I've seen this industry in and out. And I know what, what doesn't work. And he says, you will feel that little brokenness, <laughs> that, that little um, desperate attempt to say, people, slow down. <laughs> it's not so bad. <laughs> so I, I take it from time to time, but lovingly. <laughs> and that, I think, is also what makes it a little bit unusual, because uh, I, I like to say uh, things which are unexpected from time to time. And uh, lastly, because I've been in this industry and because I want this book to actually help as well, and because I listened to my editor and my editor said it has to be a little bit more easy to understand, uh, I, added, uh, I added exercises which uh, bring it home mm -hmm. because uh, transformation doesn't come from what you know. Humanity has known all the wisdoms for thousands of years. There's nothing new being said in this world. Trust me, I've heard all the authors of contemporary world and I've read a lot of authors of before. Nothing new is ever being said uh, because knowledge doesn't change your life. It's the experience plus knowledge which changes this perspective, which actually helps you to shift your paradigm and changes your life. That's why I have exercises in the book, uh, which uh, makes it a little bit more of a textbook. <laughs> Because I want people to not just read and say, aha, but also experience and suddenly see the world differently. Mm, that's so beautiful. And I'm sure you have seen a lot of that where it's reading the textbook, but not necessarily doing the work. And it's in the doing work that we actually have the transformation. You could read all the textbooks yes. in the world, but if you're not going to use them or if you're not going to implement it into your life, then... I don't know, then it's knowledge that's not being used. So yes, that's beautiful. So when you're talking about the imperfection piece, dive a little bit more into that with the book when you're speaking about it or how you how you pull that out of people, how you navigate through it. So um as as we I'm I'm coming back to what we were talking about a little bit earlier, where um where other people's opinions are just about themselves. Uh, I am actually such a huge advocate for uh, letting people be in a way. Uh, I do not believe in uh, fixing uh, other people. Uh, and um, I can't guarantee anybody their transformation because it's um, every every human being, it's, it's in their own hands. What I can do is that I can... Uh, share ideas, I can share exercises, I can share uh, things that I've seen work 
uh, or share things that I don't work or warn against them. But it's up to up to every single person who picks up the book to uh, either do the work or just uh, witness. And yes, in 20 years in this industry, I've seen a lot of people who are hooked on learning, but in a way avoid transformation so they can stay stay uh, students forever <laughs> or maybe or maybe they just don't know it's it's but it's part it's part of how we are we we sometimes don't want to change we actually we, most of the time we don't want to change because change change is scary change means that you have to admit that certain things didn't work about you it it threatens our identity uh so I can't I can't influence people. I can only share, but I cannot expect people to even listen to my advice. I cannot uh, demand that people listen to my advice. So it's it's interesting. I I like to say that I'm not a teacher. I'm just a, uh, just your company. I do not know. Maybe maybe it's not what people expect, but that's that's how I feel. Well, I I agree with you. I think that there are a lot of people where they are afraid to change because you're exactly right. I just wrote this down because it that becomes their identity, and so then how do you how do you change? And then all of a sudden you start finding that other things in your life starts to change. Your friends start to change. Your family starts to change. How people act around you. How your how your uh, community shifts around you. Everything. But that's the beauty of it as well, is that that's a part of the transformation. And it can be very scary for some people to do that, Mm -hmm. you know, to really step into who am I outside of other things that they've been attaching to. But ultimately, I I believe there are two reasons why we're afraid of change. One is exactly what you said, that when you change most likely you will have to change your life as well or circumstances in your life, because the new you will probably would not you know, match very well with the old world, right. <laughs> with the old world. But another reason why people are afraid of changes, uh, it brings us back to the, the main topic of this conversation, is because we are afraid that um, that it will be hard to love myself. Mm. You know, when you when you go on this path of transformation, it's so hard to admit that 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 picture of perfection, that facade is not what it really is and to see the real you because you're afraid that if you see that what what's really there will you have what it takes to still love you because you see since since we are very small kids we are taught that love needs to be earned with proper kind of behavior with being a good girl or a good boy um you know doing the right things that's that's how we are brought up. We do something and people judge, is it good or is it bad? And then depending on that, they deal out love to us. So we learn from a very early age. And, and even well-meaning parents do that. I, I have done that accidentally, you know, subconsciously without thinking. Your child misbehaves. And while mom still loves the child, she makes a play or she, she makes a show of, okay, you don't deserve my love right now. I'll give it back to you. I know that I'll give it back to you. But I have only once seen the scared impression, expression on my daughter's face when I was angry with her. And it struck me. I actually calmed down and I asked her, are you afraid that I, what are you afraid of? And she said, I'm afraid that you don't love me. Wow. And that's that just sounds unbelievable because I know I do. Maybe I'm angry. But you see, because of that kind of dynamics, we grow up believing that to deserve love, you have to behave well. You have to do the right thing. Mm. And then you do that to yourself. You keep doing that to yourself all your life. On self-talk, you will realize all the instances where you take away love from yourself. Oh, I didn't perform very well. I, I don't deserve love right now. Oh, I actually didn't keep my cool. I don't deserve love. Oh, I didn't stick to my diet. I don't deserve love. Wow. So it's the it's the balance, not even the balance, it's the beauty of loving yourself in everything, through everything, through the most difficult moments, through the mess ups, through the choosing relationships that you wouldn't otherwise. It's it's all of it. It's 
you know, loving yourself for living through a really hard divorce, loving yourself for living through the death of a parent and being able to cry, which I just did a few minutes before I jumped on here, mind you, when I looked at the, my phone and saw my mom's voicemail from 2019 and I listened to it and I thought, oh my gosh, it just brought up so many emotions, right? Of everything, of that connection that we had in those times that maybe I could have been a bit little a better daughter with her, right? And it's it's loving yourself through all of that and saying, you know what, I'm human and I I deserve to love me regardless. You know, people are so afraid of giving themselves love in those moments because they think as if they might force me to do better. No, mm. it's just adding insult to injury. If your child fails, what? how does love look when your child does something wrong? It's, you know, just because you love yourself doesn't mean that you're going to be uh, indulging yourself or you, if you love yourself, you will want yourself to succeed. We are, we, we think so badly about, about ourselves. We think that it's only fear, punishment, criticism, which may make us do better. But that's not that's not true. When you love your child, when the child fails, you, usually you encourage that child. You say, it's okay, I still love you. I'll support you. What can we do to, you know, to do it better next time? That's why people are afraid of self-love. They think that they will stop growing. When in reality, it's the opposite. That's That's when you will actually thrive. Yeah. I agree with you. I agree with you. I I have found in, let me know in your life as well, that the deeper that I have gone within myself and really sat with who I am and the more that I've loved myself, uh, the more I have thrived, right? That's that it's become this space of being able to give to others, receive, to be able to give to myself to receive. And for me, that's the thriving space. It's this beautiful space of how how far can we go with this and how can mm-hmm. we create a better world with it? Because ultimately we really do need a better world. We need to be able to love one another unconditionally, regardless of. Yes. And if if we make it very simple, you know, it's the easiest thing is to be you. <laughs> so very often when we're trying to be anything else, we're just wasting so much energy doing absolutely unproductive things so if you just give yourself permission to be you you'll you'll free up the space to do the things that matter yeah you have me it's in a very simple terms goodness (laughs) sake this is like uh, this is deep i this is like making me seriously think about all sorts of things it's diving me into my own life right now why why do we why do we have a hard time why are we afraid of relationships is it because like for example why can we in some relationships be totally fine, right? Like client relationships, friendships, we know how to do what we know how to do. And then it gets really scary to step into other relationships. If it's intimate relationships, if it's, you know, dating, if it is marriage, if it is connection, why is it so, why is it so scary? You know, I, relationships is definitely not my forte. Ah. Well, after all, I'm a divorced woman. <laughs> I don't think I've ever studied that field enough, um, but I would imagine that this is the this, this is the area where our ego is most uh, in danger. Uh, but of course, I'm 45 now, so I guess uh, there are other forces at play as well. At some point, you realize that you don't want to settle, and and uh, you know the pool of opportunities is also dwindling, and then your bar is really high. <laughs> And then a lot of the people who are about your age also <laughs> not willing to uh, to compromise on anything. So there, I guess there are a lot of things. But again, I'm not a uh, I'm not an expert in that in that field. Um, what I do believe is uh, your most important relationship is the relationship with yourself. Right. Uh, everything else is uh, negotiable in a way. I d- we all need people that we love. If we need some uh, romance and uh, erotic excitement as well, but we can also write our own rules. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, you can love your children, you can love your students, you can love your, uh, I don't know, rescued animals if you have to. You can love your parents. You can have uh, romantic and erotic relationships in a, in a marriage, in a committed relationship, or be single. It's fine. Uh, I, I'm not the one to define how people have to live. And, and prescribe it to them. What I can suggest is that if you are at peace with yourself, 
then your relationships with the world will start changing and whatever you what what kind of relationship whatever relationships you form you will probably be at peace with them because if if you're not if you truly love yourself you'll walk out of the things that don't work for you yeah yeah i agree with you i agree with you it's um it's always something that i like to dive into a little bit with people because there are a lot of listeners right now that are i know a lot of my listeners that are single that are looking and dating and getting into other relationships and they do find it be, to be very difficult at this age mm. And, you know, loving yourself first, you nailed it. Having that relationship with yourself first is what is most important. And don't settle. Don't settle for what is not um, what is not what you're what this loving self of who you are would want to bring into your life. You know, redefine things. You don't yeah. have to follow the rules. Not, not in the 21st century if you live in a safe, affluent, dip- democratic country. Uh, if you live elsewhere, then I, I wouldn't I, I wouldn't give advice like that because, I, I mean, I've lived for 16 years in Asia. I know it's not always our choice, and I was born in Soviet Union. It's not always our choice. But you can redefine rules, and, um, and we can connect with people. It doesn't mean we have to necessarily you know, get married. <laughs> we, right. can, we can connect with, with people in different ways. And if, uh, if you feel lonely, you need to find people who will support you. I believe, uh, I think support is important. And, uh, and there are people out there, there are friends, if you can't, if you don't have family, you know, you can, you can find friends, if you can't find lovers and family, it's, it's fine. Right. So how does this play into this perfectionism, quote, imperfection that that we uh that you write about in the book how does this dive into it a little bit more let's let's go there well i think that perfectionism is a trap uh it's uh we we talked about it and and i would probably say the same thing but in a slightly different context we have the picture of what it means to be a perfect me and we are attached to that picture and whatever doesn't correspond to that picture that's the bad behavior <laughs> that, uh, that that actually brings upon the, the the withdrawal of love um and also perfectionism is exactly the thing that creates the dark side that later we have to heal because whatever doesn't fit that picture of perfection, we shove it away. We don't deal with that. We try to uh, fix it, or, which is also actually painful. You know, forcing yourself out of being you is traumatic. Realize that We think that any kind of fixing is good for you, but it's not. Some things, if you try to force them out of your system, are going to traumatize you, not make you better or stronger. It's it's about and when I say some things, it's because we are so different. So you know, for for someone, perfectionism is not a big deal, but for someone, that's the dead end. That's the thing that actually prevents them from everything. I used to call myself um, recovering perfectionist until I realized I can't re- recover from being me. Mm. <laughs> There's a difference between bad habits and your innate qualities. I can get rid of bad ha- habits, but there are are things I can't get rid of. And then the question is, the more you you fight that dragon, the more it actually takes you down. The more you, the less you are you because you're trying to be something else, what you are not. So with certain parts about our own being, the path and the way is not to improve it or fix it or change it, but to just face the truth. That's what you are. Now, how can you live with that? Mm, mm, mm. Okay. So there, like, I'm going to go back and take notes on all of that. Just so you know, the part about the perfectionism creates the darkness, the trauma that we then have to go back and heal. I mean, yes. can we just sit with that for a second? Because I know that in my own life, that that is true. I have had that same thing where it was this thriving or or not thriving, but this, like this innate wanting to be perfect, right. In some parts. And then all it does is create more trauma in your life. It creates more chaos. It creates more issues. Yeah. Wow. There's so many good nuggets in that. There's some, how do you work out of, how do you, uh, you mentioned this unbecoming to become kind of peace, right? How do you work with people to do that? You see, I'm a, I'm an entrepreneur, so I don't, uh, I'm, I'm not a, 
psychotherapist, so I don't work. Well, no, of course. Not. Yeah, yeah. I've only worked in groups, and um, and uh, usually, usually it's a path to uh, it's it, it's you know it's a path which steps. It's not like um, you can come from 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 being so uh, out of touch with what you really are to to loving yourself it's uh, it's not one step it's a, it's a series of steps so for me it starts with obviously with awareness because you have to notice what's happening what's happening in your head what's your self talk what's happening in your relationships with the world with not just people but even events you know an event happens how do you interpret it so it starts with awareness and then um i talk about honesty because that's one of the very curious topics we live <laughs> you know the world is an illusion right <laughs> so you have to be you have to be very clear about it being an illusion and for you to be to be able to see uh, or to 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 lo- to learn to love yourself you first have to know who you are going to love it's like with relationships when you start dating someone you fall in love and it's kind of cool but you are not ready to truly truly deeply love until you know the person in all their perfect and imperfect qualities you have to know the person before you love the person so honesty is an important uh, an important step there and from there the whole uh the whole path starts unwinding uh you you really need to uh, to have the courage to to face your truth, <laughs> to face your truth, and uh, and to uh, acknowledge that there are certain certain dragons <laughs> in your being. <laughs> I like to call them dragons because it's uh, it's such a vivid picture. Uh, then uh, then uh, look those dragons in the eyes and and just have the courage to say, okay, you are here now. So what do we do? In the words of one of my um, favorite teachers, who is gone by now, uh, Sean Stevenson, he used to say, "Are you going to make it your curse or your blessing?" And then the moment when you choose to, okay, this is just what I am. What? How can I do the best with that? That's that's when you're ready to to love yourself. It's beautiful. But you have to do the work before you love yourself. You can't just love yourself without knowing who you are. Well, <laughs> that's I- why I don't believe in that. Like. I'm fine. Take me the way I am. No, it's not so simple. <laughs> are you really fine? Or are you just trying to, you know, to drown the noise in the loudness of your confidence? <laughs> I, I, I could not have said it any better, though. It's so it's it's so it's so um, relatable in my own life as well. What else do you uh, speak about within the book, within the work that you do? Because I know you've got like so many, you are, you are such a wise woman, by the way. I listened to you and you were such a wise woman. Oh and God, I remember, you. yeah, well, of course. And I remember this from our podcast. Um, it was, it left me like, wow, I need to start, I need to start reading a little bit more uh, in, in not just this one personal development space, but get out there more, right? So what other parts, give us some more of your, of your Christina wisdom. <laughs> um, you know, it's interesting, but I don't think I uh, wrote, a, like what we were talking about, I don't think a lot of that is in the book, in fact. <laughs> it's, I think life is such a constant uh, journey and there's so much happening all the time. There's so much to discover all the time. Of course, I honesty and about awareness and about kindness and self-love and about how the world is your reflection but maybe in slightly different terms uh one of the very important pieces which we didn't talk about is dealing with painful or uncomfortable emotions because this is the skill that we we often miss in school (laughs) and nobody teaches us and of course this journey is going to bring up a lot of uh unpleasantness uh, mostly shame but other things as well so I, I give uh, I give what I call emotional ABC or a very simple algorithm how, how to deal with that. Uh, I talk about um, about uh, success versus happiness. About I do talk about happiness just a little bit more than than uh, than success. <laughs> uh, we talk about. Um, uh, I'm very philosophical by the end of the book because I just love uh, I love to take life philosophically. It's it's. Uh, one of the coping mechanisms, by the way, humor and philosophy. <laughs> and um, we all, I also talk about uh, seeing things past uh, past their surface, seeing into the essence of things. Uh, we get so distracted by big words or, or the buzzwords or the familiar words, even happiness. I know, you know, we 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 never really define what it is, 
but ber- such words as uh, authenticity or vulnerability are keywords in my book. I uh, I actually try to deconstruct all of that. So so it's it's uh, an interesting journey, and I hope there is uh, enough humor and quirkiness to be enjoyable, <laughs> not just not just deep and <laughs> deep and thought provoking. Well, knowing you and having sat with you for multiple hours, actually, now I can say that I am sure that it's the beautiful flow of all of it together that just makes this incredible. I'm looking forward to reading it. I'm really looking forward to reading it. Oh, thank you so much. Oh, gosh. Oh, gosh. When I when I found out that your book was coming out, I was all excited. I thought, oh, my gosh, yay, we get one more to read, one more of the how many- <laughs> How many millions that are being released every year? But that's the beauty of it. You know, I think that the beauty of, the beauty of writing books. I've heard, I've heard the number. I have to check it. No, it, it, it's, you know what? It, it is scary. It's a lot. Yeah. It's a lot. Yeah. It, it's a lot. But also humanity knows everything. We know answers to every single question. Don't we just don't make the change. We just don't make the change. <laughs> See right there. Like, that's so true. It's so true. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Well, let's see. What other what other tips could you leave with our listeners right now? What other what would you like to leave with them? The simplest thing to leave you with would be uh in your path to wherever you're going in your personal growth, uh try for a month to replace judgment with curiosity. Mm. And see how it works. Mm. Yes. Yes, please, yes. And you know what? I'm going to follow up with that. Do that and then Post it in the social media, tag you, tag Christina, tag myself in your stories or wherever else. And uh, let us just share with us, share with us what it's like using your curiosity in place of judgment and where that leads you to. I would love to hear from people. That would be beautiful. So where can people find you, Christina? So of course you can find me in Mindvalley because I'm a co-founder of Mindvalley. <laughs> and, uh, but my favorite place would be probably my own uh, social media, which is Christina Mand. Uh, that's my handle. And Christina is written with a K because I'm from Estonia. Uh, and uh, yeah, my book, my book is both on Mindvalley and on my own page. I would uh, strongly recommend if you're interested, if you want to buy a book to do it on um, my page, because it comes with a bonus. Uh, <laughs> it comes with a program on self-love, 10, 10 day program on self-love, which I recorded spe- specially to accompany the book. Uh, it doesn't, uh, I mean, there are, of course, there are touching points um but uh it's it's not it's not an audiobook it's a program <laughs> oh i love it i'm gonna definitely be doing that that's fantastic uh and could you um we're gonna have uh, just so everybody knows everything is in the show notes so go take a look and uh grab the everything from her website we'll have in their instagram handles and as well so I'm just so excited to have you on thank you for being here and uh, what beautiful thing can I ask you something what is the what beautiful thing are you planning for 2023 for you so the my biggest project is of course the book and it is for me <laughs> it is my you know when you when you need to express yourself you're not content until it's out yeah. for me it's my ultimate creation uh, being being for such a long time in the industry probably not i i love writing so I'll probably write another book uh in addition to that I, um i'm a hobby farmer and uh, i have a bunch of sheep uh, we just had uh, four little lambs and a few more sheep are uh, expecting <laughs> i do not know if it's correct way to say about sheep <laughs> and i'm planning to buy some uh, some highland cows and also we have an old house in that farm where my family has lived since 1632 so I am. Um, I can't wait uh, to to restore it into a museum, but it's 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 been a long and complicated project. So, wow, these I are love- the things apart from the book. <laughs> I cannot wait to come and take a tour. Oh my gosh, I love it! I will be there for sure. Thank you so much for being. Here. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, I look forward to whatever this unfolds into for not only you, but myself and together. Thank you. Thank you so much. And and thank you for being so kind. And, and oh. yes, thank you. I love it. I love everything about interviewing you. It's just too much fun. <laughs> thank you. <Anna. laughs>